So in 2020, as you'll recall, we had a little worldwide pandemic that forced a lot of us to hole up in our homes alone, drastically limiting our interactions with friends and families and strangers alike. A lot of people understandably did not enjoy this. Uh, People who lived alone now had no in-person interactions, couldn't touch or hug their loved ones. They had to get all of their socializing through texts and phone calls and Zoom calls and social media. And the people who did live with others were now basically stuck with a small handful of humans or one other human. And no matter how much you love someone, if you're stuck in a small enough space with them for enough time, eventually you probably will try to murder them just because of the peculiar way they sip their tea in the morning. There's a reason why NASA puts astronauts through intense psychological training before they decide that, yes, this person can hang out on the space station for a few months without going event horizon on it everyone. A year or so into the pandemic, I began noticing more and more articles about an epidemic of loneliness plaguing society. And I thought, well, of course, there's an epidemic of loneliness. Like, look at what is happening in the world. But when I actually dug into it, I realized that this idea actually predates COVID-19. Public health officials have been sounding the alarm about the rise of loneliness since at least 2010, when an AARP report found that 35% of U.S. adults over the age of 45 reported loneliness. It's important to note that loneliness isn't the same as being alone. The UCLA loneliness scale does include measures of social isolation, like I feel completely alone, but it mostly focuses on statements like I am unhappy doing so many things alone, as opposed to just I do many things alone. It also includes statements like people are around me, but not with me, acknowledging that it's possible to have a large social network, but still feel lonely. Loneliness is the difference between how connected we feel to other people versus how we envision our ideal connection with other people. Okay, you might be thinking, who cares though? Uh, Everyone feels lonely sometimes, it's not the end of the world. Well, that AARP study found that loneliness was a significant predictor of poor health and also was positively associated with drug use. As early as 1988, researchers have compared a lack of social connections to a rise in mortality similar to smoking cigarettes. Interesting side note on this one, I constantly found pretty mainstream trustworthy sources claiming that loneliness is associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day. But each of those claims seemed to end up back at this paper from 1988, which doesn't quantify the number of cigarettes. Just that social relationships or the relative lack thereof constitute a major risk factor for health, rivaling the effects of well-established health risk factors such as cigarette smoking, blood pressure, blood lipids, obesity, and physical activity. Indeed, the theory and evidence on social relationships and health increasingly approximate that available at the time of the U.S. Surgeon General's 1964 report on smoking and health, with similar implications for future research and public policy, and that the age-adjusted relative risk ratios shown in figures one and two are stronger than the relative risks for all-cause mortality reported for cigarette smoking. There is, however, less specificity in the associations of social relationships with mortality than has been observed for smoking, which is strongly linked to cancers of the lung and respiratory tract. But yes, over the decades, researchers have found more and more evidence that loneliness is a real problem for humans in terms of our physical and mental health. We evolved to be social creatures and to yearn for meaningful connections with others. So it makes sense that if we don't get those connections, we're more stressed out and more stress equals more disease and a lower quality of life. All of this is just a preamble to the study I'd really like to talk about today. Do associations between sense of purpose, social support, and loneliness differ across the adult lifespan? It was published last month in the American Psychological Association's journal, Psychology and Aging. So psychologists delved into the survey results of more than 2,000 Swiss adults who described their feelings of loneliness over the course of a month. They also took a survey to determine how those subjects felt about their life's purpose. What gets them out of bed every day? 
which, you know, it could be their job, their family, or a hobby. And they were answering statements like, most of what I do seems trivial and unimportant to me, or I have lots of reasons for living. The researchers found that people who reported greater sense of purpose were less lonely, and not just for people whose purpose involved giving or getting support from other people. So yes, people whose passion was volunteering at a food bank uh, where they meet and interact with new people, those people are less lonely, but also the people whose passion is translating Latin poetry in their basement, those people also reported less loneliness. What's all this mean? Well, it means that in the face of, say, a global pandemic that forces you to limit your social interactions with other people, you might actually be able to fight the feelings and the negative effects of loneliness just by finding a hobby you love. By the way, this all goes right along with past research like this study from 2009 that found that greater purpose in life, just like lack of loneliness, is associated with a reduced risk of all-cause mortality among community-dwelling older persons. All of this made me think about my own reaction to the social isolation that came along with 2020. A lot of people tend to think of me as an extrovert. I do have extroverted tendencies. So many people might expect that I just went completely bonkers in quarantine. I mean, like more bonkers than usual or a different kind of bonkers, like type B bonkers. And honestly, I I thought I would too because because of my extroverted traits. But to be honest, I was fine, like happy even. Not only was I living with my husband, my now husband, whose tea drinking habits did not make me want to murder, even though we lived in a small apartment, uh, but I was also one of those people that dove right into finding new hobbies to do. It was a bit of a joke back then, like, yeah, all these people are bored at home and now they're finding these new hobbies like knitting or sourdough bread making. But I love trying new hobbies and not all of them stuck, okay? RIP to Budin Tang, the 2020 sourdough mother. But other hobbies I took up were life-changing, honestly. Like I learned that not only could I keep houseplants alive, but that I could propagate them, give them to friends, help them learn to grow. And now I'm growing my own native plant pollinator garden and food crops. And when I get stressed out while writing scripts, by which I mean scrolling social media, I take a break and I walk outside and I just like stare at my beans. Not a euphemism. It's so simple, but seeing this thing grow from a seed to a seedling to a plant and then watching the bees and hummingbirds turn flowers into food, it's like, I don't know, it's just like a big middle finger to entropy and death and pointlessness. Like, it's a small thing, but it's really rewarding for me. And, you know, am I going to do it forever? No, probably not. That's why I have backup hobbies that I get that, you know, give me an equal amount of joy, like keeping the world's dumbest but cutest dog alive, for instance. And I do think that while COVID ultimately was horrible, obviously, you know, for humanity in terms of illness and death and yes, loneliness, I think that there were a lot of lucky people out there who were suddenly inspired to explore new passions and that they might not have done that were it not for quarantine. So many of us spend a ridiculous portion of our lives in jobs that we may or may not find rewarding. And for those who are lucky enough to find passion in their job, um, once that's over, when they retire, they're going to be at that disadvantage. They're going to need to find a new passion or be at risk of loneliness. And it's one of the reasons why research shows that older people tend to suffer more from loneliness. And like for the other people, the ones who aren't passionate about their jobs, you know, it's really rough because we spend so much time at the job and then we come home and then many people, myself included, just start scrolling social media and news feeds or watching trash TV. It's the mental version of eating junk food. You know, it's easy. It gives us that little dopamine reward, but it could also be encouraging us to miss out on those harder but healthier and ultimately more rewarding experiences. Anyway, that's why I support universal basic income and healthcare, work from home policies where it's feasible, a three-day work week, paid vacation 
vacation and sick days, all of these things that we would honestly put into place if we were just building a society from scratch right now because the data shows that it makes us all happier and healthier. Anyway, I know it can be hard to find something that you're passionate about, especially if you, like me, suffer from pesky conditions like severe depression and anxiety. So I'm going to end this video by giving you a partial list of some of the hobbies and passions that I've enjoyed over the years that were relatively cheap and easy. Maybe one day, you know, you'll be bored and instead of opening up and refreshing your Threads by Meta app, God help us all. By the way, I'm actually Rebecca Watson on there. Please follow and like. I, oh God. Anyway, maybe instead of that, you'll do one of these, okay? Juggling, easier than you think, I promise. Uh, coin and card tricks. You could take up reading, get a library card. By the way, my library also gives out free tickets to local museums, um, and they also have a seed card catalog, like a seed library that you can uh, take out seeds and plant a garden. So you can also garden. And on that note, you can identify and grow native plants. I recommend the free Seek app. Uh, you could take a bird watching, try Cornell's free Merlin ID app. You can identify other local wildlife, like by exploring tide pools or looking for insects. Try the iNaturalist app. You can grow herbs on your windowsill if you don't have outdoor space. You can hike your local parks and green spaces, which has its own wealth of psychological benefits. You can try macrame. I swear it's really easy and it's actually very soothing. You can foster an animal like a dog or a kitten or a bunny. If you can't foster, you can volunteer at your local pet shelter, or you can volunteer at an old folks home or a community garden. Google your town's name and uh, volunteer opportunities. You can get into athletics. Running is cheap and easy to start. Calisthenics are also cheap and easy. You don't need much equipment at all. And yes, you can take up sourdough bread making. No, it's ultimately not for me, but it is really fascinating that you can just take flour and water and then invisible things in the air will just magically turn that into the delicious bread. Uh, one sack of flour, endless entertainment for uh, at least a month or until you forget to feed your mother and it turns into something truly disgusting in your refrigerator. Anyway, good luck. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you loved the video, please subscribe. And if you think the world could use more videos like this and you happen to have a few bucks laying around, head to patreon.com slash Rebecca and join an awesome community of nerds like the people whose names you see on the screen right now. Thanks.